for you all um, starting next year. Um, so, so I'm glad you were able to join us this fall. Um, so we will we'll give a, a few minutes, uh, a few um, seconds for those students that, again, are here to review for their BATH 1324. Just go ahead and click on that link that's on the chat. Um, and you will go to your own session for Math 1324, okay? So the rest of you who are here, we're, we're going to review for um, the Math 1314. Um, as, as you're all aware, today was our last day of classes. So, so after today, there's no more classes, and next week is just finals week. So make sure you, um, you have down um, the date of your final for your, for your class, okay? So... Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's first um, look at uh, our concepts of, of looking at an equation and finding the x and y intercepts and also testing for symmetry. Okay, so, so to find the x-intercept, um, we need to set our y value equal to zero and solve for x. So when we, ha we have this equation, y is equal to minus 2x plus 1, we're going to set y equals to 0 and solve for x, okay? So we will first subtract 1 on both sides, um, and then we'll divide by a negative 2 on both sides, and we have x is equal to 1 half, okay? So to find the y-intercept, then we have to set um, x equal to 0, and then we solve for y. So we'll do the same process. Uh, we set x equal to 0, so negative 2 times 0, that's 0. Um, 0 plus 1, that's 1. So our y-intercept is equal to 1. Okay. So to, and if we were to graph this, again, we have this, um, we all know now that this is a linear equation, and this line will cross at these two points. When, when um, y is, is equal to 0, ex is going to be the 1 half. And when x is equal to 0, y will be 1, okay? Now, if we were checking for our um, symmetry, okay, there are several rules that we check for for symmetry. So if we have x-axis symmetry, um, we have um, this situation where the x, y, um, the x-axis symmetry will give us a negative y. So let's check for for our x-axis, excuse me, x-axis symmetry by replacing y with negative y and solving for y. Okay. So when we do this, okay, we replace our y with negative y um, and then solve for y. And when we do this, okay, we have to multiply um, both sides by or divide both sides by a negative one, and this is going to give us y is equal to two x minus one. And we notice that it's not the same equation when we solve for y. Our original equation is y is equal to negative 2x plus 1. And when we substituted the negative y, we're getting a positive 2x with a minus 1. So this means that it has no x-axis symmetry. Um, to check for the y-axis symmetry, we do the same, except we're replacing the x with a negative x. And we're going to solve for y again. So when we replace the x with a negative x, we have a negative 2 times a negative x is going to give us a positive 2x plus 1. And this one as well, it's not, ex it's not the same as the original equation, so it has no y-axis symmetry. And the last one, to check for the origin symmetry, we replace both the x and y with a negative x and negative y. And when we do this um, and solve for y again, we are going to get y is equal to negative 2x and minus 1. And this one also does not give us the um, exact or uh, equal equation that was given. So hence, this equation has no symmetry. So it doesn't meet any of our conditions. Our answer is no symmetry. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at this other um, example. Oh, and again, before I continue, if anybody has any questions, um, wants to review a little bit more on a particular problem, please feel free to stop me, okay? If I go too fast, let me know. So we have this next example. Write the standard form of the equation of the circle with the given characteristics. So first, 
uh, we need to know the equation of the standard form of a circle, which is this, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared, where h and k is my center and r is my radius. So if they're giving me the center and they're giving me the radius, all I have to do is substitute these values into my equation. So here I have um, h is negative 4, so we have x minus negative 4 squared plus um, our k was 2, so it's just y minus 2 squared, and my r is 2, so that's 2 squared. So we go ahead and simplify. So um, we add a negative times a negative is going to give me a positive. Um, this one, there's nothing for us to simplify. And the 2 squared, um, 2 times 2 is 4. So this is the answer um, for, for this given condition. The so center at negative 4, 2, and a radius 2. The standard form of the circle is x plus 4 squared plus y minus 2 squared is equal to 4. Okay. All right, let's try this one. Write an equation of the lines through the given points that are parallel to and perpendicular to the given line. Um, and I believe in our web assigned homework, they also wanted us to give these equations in slope-intercept form. So, so they're giving us two, two uh, very important informations. They're giving us an equation that they want us um, to have our two um, equations, both parallel and perpendicular, be um, to this given line. But our equations also have to go through this point, 8, 1. Okay? So first, what we need to know is, what is the slope? Because we know that if we have the same slope, we're going to have parallel lines. And then if we have what I call an opposite slope, that means we'll have a perpendicular line. So first, let's find out what is our slope with this given equation. So to do that, I like to convert it into this equation, which is in standard form um, or general form, convert it into slope-intercept form so I can find out what the slope is. So let's solve for y. So when I do this, when I, when I have 8x minus 2y is equal to 3, I solve for y and I get this. y is equal to negative 3 halves plus 4x. So what this is telling me is that my slope is 4, right? The negative 3 half is my, my, uh, my b or my y-intercept. But what I'm interested in is only on the slope. So m is equal to 4. So now that I have this, what I can use is since they're giving me a point to find the parallel line, I'm going to use the point slope formula now. And the point slope formula is given by this. y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1, where x1 and y1 is the point that I want my line to go through. And of course, m refers to my slope. Um, so let's go ahead and do the parallel one, which we know that for two lines to be parallel, they have to have the same slope and different y-intercepts. So let's go ahead and plug in our, our information into our equation. So we have y minus 1, which is the point that we want, the y value. And we have the slope 4, and we want it to go through our x value 8. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, guys. Give me one second, okay? Sorry, guys. Thank you. Okay, so now that we substitute our values into our point slope formula, um, let's go ahead and um, put it into slope-intercept form by solving for y. Okay, so we first distribute our 4 to the x minus 8, which is going to give us the 4x minus 32, and then subtract 1 on both sides to solve for y. And this gives us the equation y is equal to 4x minus 31. So this equation is our parallel equation because it has the same slope at 4. So now if we want to find the equation that is perpendicular to this given equation, we need to find its slope. So to find the perpendicular slope, I like to take the reciprocal of this 4, uh, 
And if I if I have this as a fraction, four over one, the reciprocal is one over four. And since it has to be the opposite slope, I, I originally had a positive slope, so this one has to be negative. So my negative perpendicular slope is negative one fourth. It still has to go through the same point, eight one, and I'm still gonna use my point slope formula. So let's go ahead and substitute in all the information. We're gonna do the same thing as we did for our parallel line. We're gonna distribute our negative one fourth into our equation, and then we're going to solve for y. And when we do this, we have this equation, y is equal to negative one fourth x plus three. And if you see, this equation has our, uh, what I consider our opposite slope, um, and this, is our equation for our perpendicular answer, okay? Any questions? All right, so let's move on to uh, basic um, operation with functions. We are going to add, subtract, multiply in functions. So let's look at these two. Let's consider these two functions, function f of x, which is yeah. 9x plus 1. Um, yeah. Sorry, guys, I have some kids in the room. Um, so let's do the first one, a, f plus g of x. So um, when we are looking at this f plus g of x, all it's saying is precisely this. We want to add function f with function g. So um, this, is, uh, this is the original syntax, but I always like to consider like this, that this is what we're doing. We're adding these two functions together. So let's go ahead and replace f of x with g of x. So f of x is this one in red, 9x plus 1. g of x is this one in blue, x squared minus 4. And all we need to do is combine like terms to get our answer. So we have uh, nothing combining with the x squared, uh, nothing combining with the 9x, but we have two constants. We can combine the plus 1 and the minus 4. That gives us minus 3. So our... Um, Addition of these two functions are x squared plus 9x minus 3. Um, B, f minus g of x. And this means that I want to subtract function f with function g. Let's go ahead and replace these with our functions that are given. Again, function f is our red one. Uh, function g is our blue one. We first distribute this negative sign to get rid of our parentheses, giving us negative x squared um, plus 4. Again, we combine the like, like terms, and we end up with negative x squared plus 9x plus 5, okay? Um, C. C wants us to multiply function f with function g. So this is how I would write it. I want to I wanna multiply function f with function g. Let's go ahead and replace these. Um, again, our red Thank one is our function. Brother. Um, our function f is the one in red. Our function g is the one in blue. Um, so to multiply this, we're basically doing FOIL. 9x is going to be multiplied with these two terms, and the 1 is going to be multiplied with these two terms. So 9x times x squared is 9x cubed. 9x times the minus 4 is the minus 36x. The plus 1 times the x squared is the x squared. And the plus 1 times the minus 4 is the minus 4. We combine our like terms. And we have the function 9x cubed plus x squared minus 36x minus 4. And then the last one, this means that we want to divide function f with function g. So I like to rewrite it like this, f of x divided by g of x. Let's go ahead and replace those. So we have 9x plus 1 divided by x squared minus 4. Now in this particular one, there's nothing for us to simplify or cancel. So our answer stays the same. Our answer for the division of function f with function g is just 9x plus 1 divided by x squared minus 4. Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, so you were asked, this is a, on the homework problem, you were asked to do the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And at the end of your web assignment assignment, you were also asked to find the domain of this division, right? Um, and they want us to check this one because we have a fraction, right? But whenever we have a fraction, we never want uh, the zero on the bottom, right? The denominator never wants to be zero because 
we have an undefined equation or problem. So is this problem um, or this function um, ever become zero for the denominator? So if we don't see it, let's go ahead and solve for it. We set x squared minus 4 equal to 0 and solve for x. And then we, and we see that we do, in fact, if x is a plus 2 or a minus 2, we would have a 0 in the denominator. So hence, these are our restrictions on, our, on this function. We cannot use this two values, the positive 2 and negative 2, because then we have an undefined function. So our domain in interval notation is given by a negative infinity to negative 2, union from negative 2 to 2, union from 2 to infinity. Okay. All right. So let's see. Does this function have an inverse? So to find um, first, let's also review. Uh, we, we know that a function is a function if we provide a certain test. And I hope you all remember this test that we provide to check that a function is a function is the vertical line test, right? If, if this imaginary vertical line crosses our graph only once, then our graph is represented by a function. Now, an inverse, the opposite of a function. So if we want to check to see if a function has an inverse, Opposite of a vertical line would be a horizontal line. So what we do is we perform a horizontal line test to see if our graph has an inverse. So on this particular one in example, we have this blue line. And if we do an imaginary horizontal line, we'll see that our imaginary horizontal line will only cross our graph only once. So hence, this graph has, a fun, has an inverse. OK? So. Um, we always want to check this, right? If we, when we're calculating for inverse, if a graph has an inverse, um, we is going to pass our horizontal line test. Okay? All right. So let's look at this example. Um, determine whether the function has an inverse. We have f of x is equal to the square root of x minus eight. And again, this information here, x has to be greater than or equal to eight means that we don't want to deal with imaginary numbers because uh, if, if, if x was greater than or equal to 8, um, we start dealing with, uh, or sorry, this is what we want, right? If, if x was less than or equal to negative 8, we would have negative numbers. So let's find out if this has an inverse. So, so this root function will pass the vertical and horizontal lenses. Therefore, the function has an inverse. So let's find this inverse. So to find the inverse, um, what I like to do is replace the function name with the variable y. Then I replace. I'll replace the y with the x and the x with the y. So I interchange them or I swap them. And then I'll solve for y again. So we have x is equal to the square root of y minus 8. Now I'm going to solve for y. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take a square both sides so I can get rid of the square root. So it's going to give me x squared is equal to y minus 8. I'm going to add 8 on both sides. And it's going to give me x squared plus 8 is equal to y. Now this uh, is an equation to signify that this is the inverse function. I'm going to replace the y with the f to the negative 1. This representation indicates that it is an inverse. Okay. All right, so let's look at this next example. Sketch the graph of the function by applying the leading coefficient test, finding the real zeros of the polynomial, plotting sufficient solution points, and drawing a continuous curve to draw this graph, right? To, gra to draw the graph of this func function given. So we have g of x is equal to negative x squared plus 12x minus 32. So to apply the leading coefficient test, uh, we want to see how the behavior of this graph based on the leading coefficient. So my leading coefficient on this function is a negative 1. Okay. So because um, it's a negative 1, um, then I know that my graph is going to be pointing downward. Now, I also know that um, 
that because this function is an even function, right? Um, this graph is going to be pointing downward, um, right? So if we're looking at this, um, our answer for this is going to be the last one. The graph of the function falls to the left and falls to the right, okay? And this is, again, based on our leading coefficient and then and because we know that this function is an even function, okay? So to review this, um, let's look at these examples that I just went over to give you the answer, okay? So we have f of x is equal to x squared. Again, this is a, an even function. Um, you see that the graph, our leading coefficient here is a positive value. So our graph is going to rise on the right and rise on the left. If we had an even function and our leading coefficient was negative, it's going to fall on the right and fall on the left. It's going to be pointing down, right? Now let's look at the cube function, okay, or an odd function. Um, so our leading coefficient here is a positive. Um, this, this graph of this odd function, given this cube, it's going to rise on the right and fall on the left. The way I like to think of the, uh, of the when our leading coefficient is positive, um, I like to think of it that it's always rising, right? I'm, if I'm reading this graph from left to right, it's always going up, right? Now, if on the odd function, um, sorry, on, on the leading coefficient, when it's negative for an odd function, um, our book says that it rises on the left and falls on the right. And again, the way I like to think of the an odd function with a negative leading coefficient, that it's, if I'm reading this graph from left to right, it's always going down, okay? So again, the answer for my problem here is this last one. Um, the graph um, of the function falls to the left and falls to the right. Okay. All right, so let's find the real zeros of the polynomial. So now that we know what the graph looks like, let's find out where it crosses the x-axis. So to do this, we'll we have a quadratic equation, and there's several methods that we learned in chapter two to, to solve for this. We can um, use our quadratic equation. We can also factor it if we want to, which is my way of choice, okay? Um, so let's do this. Let's go ahead and factor it. It's my, my favorite choice to, to solve for x on a quadratic equation. So to factor this, when I factor this, I have these factors. Uh, x minus 8 times x minus 4. So I use now my, my zero rule that says that the product of two numbers, the only way that I'm going to get zero is if either x minus 8 is equal to zero or x minus 4 is equal to zero. So knowing that, when I solve for x, I'm able to solve for my intercepts. On x minus 8, x is equal to 8. On x minus 4, x is equal to 4. So these are my two x-intercepts. Okay, I can also find my y-intercept, and that one's the easy to find, to find my y-intercept, like that first example that we did starting on this session. We said x equal to 0. So everywhere I see x, I'm going to plug in a 0. So this is going to give me y is equal to negative 32. Um, also in chapter 2, since we're dealing with a quadratic equation, they gave us a formula to find the vertex of a quadratic, um, and it's given by this, this uh, formula. To find the x value of the vertex, we have to select uh, the negative b over 2a. Again, to review, when we have a quadratic equation, um, it's its um, standard form is given by ax squared plus bx plus c. So in my Example, a is negative 1, b is 12, c is negative 32. So when I plug in these values to find my x value, I find that x is equal to 6. So this is the x value of my vertex for this given function. To find the y value, using the formula, it states that I plug in this 6 back to the original function. So everywhere I see x, I'm going to plug in 6, so which we have here. And when I do this, excuse me, my y value is equal to 4. 
So my vertex for this given function is 6, 4. So now I have several points to plot um, to, to get a graph. Okay, so I have my vertex is, is my highest point on my parabola. And I know this because, again, uh, we know that our parabola was pointing downward because of our leading coefficient um, work that we did. And we can find these two points, the x-intercept at x equals 4, x equals 8. And again, if we wanted to have a, a better graph, we, can, we could have plot a few more points to, to get a more accurate graph. Okay. All right, so to find the rational zeros of a polynomial function, we can use what's called the rational zero test. Um, and again, this is a test I always stress to my students. Okay, this test is uh, when you do a test, you either get a good result or you get a bad result, right? Or it'll come out positive or it'll come out negative. So when we do this test, this is to find possible zeros, okay? This is not telling you that all of these are the zeros for a function, but these are all the possible zeros. It, it, it could be that we find all of the zeros. We can possibly, we can find two of the zeros or one of the zeros or none of the zeros, okay? It's just a test. So the, the rational zero test says that you get the factors of the constant divided by the factors of the leading coefficient. So in this example, my, my constant is the 9. So the factors of 9 are 1, 3, and 9. I'm not interested in the sign because when I do the test, I'm going to be looking at both the positive and negative values. So I'm not interested in what the, what the symbol for the 9 is. I'm only interested in the value. Same with my leading coefficient. My, my, my leading coefficient is 1. I'm not interested in its sign because I'm going to look at both the positive and negative values of 1. So when I do this, I'm going to do this division to find my possible rational zeros. I'm going to divide one by one. The positive one divided by a positive one, that gives me the positive one. A negative one divided by a positive one, that gives me the negative one. Okay. Um, also, we don't do duplicates because negative one divided by a positive one will give me a negative one, but I already have that. So I won't write that one twice. Okay. So when we do these divisions, we get these zeros, negative 9, negative 3, negative 1, 1, 3, and 9. These are all possible rational zeros using our rational zero test. Okay, now why would we want to know the possible zeros? Because now that we know what the possible zeros, we can use now what we learned also is um, doing synthetic division to simplify our, our polynomial or function here. So if we see that we have a a degree three polynomial, if we divide it by a factor, we can reduce this by a factor of one. So we can make this cube function into a square function. And that would be great for us because we know that, that we have tools in our disposal to factor a square function, right? We can use our quadratic equation or we can factor as, as we did in the example before. So and, and we did all the possible zeros because we don't want to just um, blindly try to check and, and test a lot of numbers to see if they're factors of a, of a polynomial. So by using the, our polynomial zero test, we don't have to try that many zeros. Um, and all we need to do is find one to reduce it to a quadratic. Okay, so let's try this one. Um, let's say that x is equal to one. Let's say that that one is a zero or a factor of this polynomial, so let's do synthetic division. So to review synthetic division, um, the first thing we do is we bring down the one, and then we're gonna multiply our one with this one. One times one is one, and then we're gonna add this column. One plus one is two, then I do it again. One times two is two. Um, so this is gonna give me minus nine plus two is negative seven. Then I do it again. One times negative seven is negative seven. And I'm gonna add my last column. Negative nine plus negative seven is negative 16. Now, because this last value, negative 16, is not a zero, then this is telling me that one is, is not a factor of this polynomial. So let's go ahead and try another value. What we want um, in our last column is an answer of zero, okay? Um, that is going to tell us that that value is a factor of this polynomial. 
So let's try negative 1. Let's do synthetic division again. We bring down our 1 and multiply it by our, our value. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. We add 1 minus 1 is 0. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. So negative 9 plus 0 is negative 9. Negative 1 times a negative 9 is a positive 9. And negative 9 plus 9 is 0. Yay, this is what we wanted. Our last value here is 0. So what this is telling us is that x equals negative 1 is a um, factor of this polynomial. So we, what we can do is our quotient, our leftover part from our, from our synthetic division, we could convert it back to an equation. Um, again, because we did a division, we lost a degree. We were given a degree 3, so we start with this first value. This 1 refers to the x squared. This would have referred to our x value, but this is like x times 0, so we don't have an x variable term. Um, and then our last term is our constant, so we have negative 9. So having this, we're able to find all the remaining zeros that are are from this polynomial, right? And we knew that we needed to have three zeros, right? Because the degree is three, this polynomial could have at most three zeros. So let's go ahead and solve for the remaining two zeros. So what I do is I'll set this equal to zero and solve for x. Um, I add nine on both sides. I'll take my square root um, um, and the square root of nine is gonna give me my two answers, the plus three, and the minus 3. So the zeros for this polynomial, again, we found the first one, um, which was negative 1 by our uh, rational 0 test. And the 2, after doing our synthetic division, we found that it's negative 3 and 3. Now, um, let's look at um, graphing this polynomial. And so again, yeah, to do a, a a rough sketch, um, let's plot our points of intersection, right? So we have a positive 3, the negative 1, and the negative 3. Um, we also can apply our behavior, right? Um, our leading coefficient here um, is a positive, and because this is an odd function and it's a cube, we saw an example of this, right? That a an odd function that has a positive leading coefficient is going to fall on the left and rise on the right. Okay. And now, if we wanted to, to be a little bit more accurate, we can pick a few more points to see the behavior between our intercepts to, to get a better graph. Okay. So, so the values that I used um, was 2. Again, it's between 0 and 3 here. And I also used um, one, just to get a, a little better sense of what the graph is. Okay, so again, plotting these points that I have, I'm able to do my graph. Okay, and uh, of course, you've you've all noticed that on WebAssign, you know, it, it's a multiple choice graph. So as long as we have a decent looking graph, we easily can determine which is our answer. Okay, all right, now. Um, next example, use the given zeros to find all the zeros of the function. Um, we have this given function, x cubed minus 12x squared plus 52x minus 80. And they're telling us we have a zero at 4 plus 2i. So just a little quick review. Uh, we all know that i is represented by an imaginary number. Um, so we can use this imaginary number and still also use synthetic division. So it's a little bit more work, but it's, it still can be done. So let's see if we can simplify this cube given this imaginary zero. Okay, so we bring down our one. We're going to multiply 4 plus 2i times 1. This is going to give me 4 plus 2i. Again, I, I, I like to use this example too, so we can review adding and subtracting imaginary numbers. So when we are adding complex numbers with, with real numbers, we are going to add the real part with real and imaginary with imaginary. Of course, our negative 12 does not have an imaginary part, so I'm just combining it with my real part. So this minus 12 is go only going to be added to the 4, which is my real part. So minus 12 plus 4 is minus 8 plus 2i. We're going to go ahead and do it again. 
and this uh, this allows us to practice the multiplication of complex numbers so it's like foil so when I do this I, I get minus 32 plus 8i minus 16i plus 42 I can combine my terms and also remember that i squared uh, is represented by negative 1 so when I simplify this I get um, negative 36 minus 8i again it's in standard form okay when we're writing complex numbers standard form is always real plus imaginary don't forget all right let's go ahead and add this we're going to add the real with real 52 minus 36 is going to give me 16 minus 8i we're going to do this product again 4 plus 2i times 16 minus 8i and this is going to give me 64 minus 32i plus 32i the minus 32i plus 32i cancels Again, i squared is represented by negative 1. So this gives me 64 minus 16 i squared. But again, at 16 minus 1. So I get 64 plus 16, which is going to give me 80. And when I subtract minus 80 plus 80, we have 0. So our quotient is x squared plus minus 8 plus 2ix plus the 16 minus 8i. So what we can do is we can um, do synthetic again to simplify this even further. So let's go ahead and do it one more time, practice our synthetic division. Um, now with our remaining quotient, okay, our x, our leading, co our, our leading coefficient here was 1. The coefficient for the x is the minus 8 plus 2i. And again, our constant is 16 minus 8i. So when we're doing the synthetic division, 4 minus 2i times 1 gives me 4 minus 2i. Add the real with real, imaginary with imaginary, gives me the minus 4. Multiply the 4 minus 2i times the minus 4. This is going to give me minus 16 plus 8i. When I add this to 16 minus 8i, I get 0. So I see now that my quotient is x minus 4. So it's easy to see that I have a zero at x equals four, okay? Um, thank you, Yvette. So we re remember that that the conjugate of a complex number, we just have to change the sign, the, the middle sign, right? Okay. All right, so these are our zeros. Given this polynomial, our zeros are zero, four plus two i, and four minus two i, okay? Um, now let's look at this rational function, okay? Let's, um, let's consider this function, which is a rational function, a fraction function, right? 1 divided by x plus 3. So A, state the domain of the function. So we know that, that we never want on a fraction function for the denominator to be equal to 0. So if we don't see, we set the denominator equal to 0. So x plus 3. So we know that if x is equal to negative 3, we will have an undefined function. So the answer for this one is all real numbers except x equals negative 3, right? So, um, which we did here. All right. So this is our answer. All real numbers x except for x equals negative 3. Okay. Um, B, identify all intercepts. Again, so to find the x-intercept, we're going to set y equal to 0. So let's set this uh, function equal to 0. So we have 0 is equal to 1 over x plus 3. We're going to multiply both sides by x plus 3. And we get 0 is equal to 1. So this is not a true statement. It's a false statement. So what this is telling me is that this particular function has no x-intercepts. Let's solve for the y-intercept. So let's set x equal to 0. So everywhere we see x, we'll replace it by 0. So we have 1 over 0 plus 3. 0 plus 3 is 3. And our function is 1 over 3. So this, this is the the y value, right? When x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1 third. So in, as an ordered pair, we have 0 comma 1 third. 
Okay. All right, C, find any vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So we practically already found our vertical asymptote. Um, any restrictions on our graph um, are, are represented as our vertical asymptotes. So we know that our vertical asymptote is um, when we set our denominator equal to zero. So we have that answer, right? So we know that our vertical asymptote, when we set x, the denominator equal to zero, we found out that x is equal to a negative three. So this is our vertical asymptote. So this is our equation of our vertical asymptote. X equals negative three. Now, for the horizontal asymptote, oh, also I'm glad um, I have this picture here. Uh, we represent our asymptotes as a dashed line, okay? It looks dotted here, but it's a dashed line in our graphs, okay? So this is the vertical line that our graph cannot cross or touch, okay? So for our horizontal asymptote, there are several cases that, that determine whether we have a horizontal asymptote. So our first case states that if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, we'll always have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Our second case or, or rule says that if the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, then we have a horizontal asymptote by the ratio of the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator. And our last case is if the degree of the numerator is bigger or larger than the degree of the denominator, then there's no horizontal asymptote, okay? So if we go back to our example here, we could, we could convert the, our numerator to something that has a degree, because I could convert um, the one into x to the exponent of zero, right? Um, and anything to the zero power is one. And, it's, and this way, we would see that the degree of the numerator is zero, the degree of the denominator is one, so hence, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, which is our case one. This tells us that we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. We have an imaginary horizontal line represented here in blue, and we represent, again, our asymptotes as dashed lines, and these lines uh, tell us that our graph cannot cross or touch them, okay? All right, so now that we have our vertical and horizontal asymptotes, we have our intercepts, um, we can plot some additional points to get a better accuracy of our graph. So uh, if we pick a few points, uh, let's say x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2. Uh, for x equals negative 2, we get y equals 1. For x equals positive 2, we get y equals to 1 fifth. Um, let's pick a few more to help us out. Um, for x equals negative 4, we get y equals negative 1. For x equals negative 5, we get y equals negative 1 half. So if we plot these points that we have here, um, and we connect the dots. Again, we have this horizontal asymptote, so we have our graph come close to this line, not touch it or cross it, and then come close to our vertical line. Our vertical asymptote did not cross it or touch it, and then we jump to the other side. We get close to our vertical asymptote. We never touched it or cross it. Then we come close to our horizontal asymptote, um, and hence this is our graph given this these uh, information. Okay. Questions? All right, so again, on WebSci, uh, we had these as a multiple choice, so again, our, our Answers are very, um, fairly easy to pick, right? We know that it's not B, and we know that it's not C. So um, the only one that um, it's looks like the graph that we picked was this one A, right, or the first one. And they're not labeled A or B or C, but again, it's easy to see. It's um, resembles a lot this first option that we have. All right, so let's move on to our next topic. Use properties of logarithms to expand the expression as a sum and difference. 
and or constant multiples of a logarithm. So first of all, for this first example, we have a log with a base five, and we have our input here that says the square root of x squared minus nine divided by four. So our input here, uh, we have a division. So we're going to apply what's called our quotient rule. Our quotient rule says that when we have a log um, of a certain base and our input is being divided, we can separate this by subtracting the numerator by the denominator. So we have the log of base 5 of the square root of x squared minus 9 minus the log of base 5 of 4. Okay, oh, But I can represent the square root as a power or as an exponent. Okay, So the square root can be written as a 1 half. And by me doing this, um, I can apply what's called my power rule. And that says that when I have an exponent to a given log, I can multiply that exponent to the log or move it to the front, right? So I apply my power rule, and this is going to give me 1 half times the log of base 5 of x squared minus 9 minus the log of base 5 of 4. Oh, but I'm still not done because I can rewrite the x squared minus 9. I know that this is a difference of squares. I can rewrite this as a factor of x minus 3 times x plus 3. And by me doing this, I can apply now my power rule that says that when I have a given log of any base and I have the input of two values that are being multiplied by each other, I can expand that by an addition. So applying my product rule, I have 1 half log of base 5 of x minus 3 plus 1 half a log of base 5 of x plus 3 minus the log of base 5 of 4. And now what I've done, I've expanded a single log to multiple logs. Okay. All right, let's do the opposite now. Let's condense a log expression. So what that means is we want to have multiple logs into a single log. And for us, keep in mind, for us to do this, they have to be the same log. Um, and what that means is they all have to have the same base. If we have logs of different base, we cannot apply the rules and we cannot condense. We can only condense with the same log. So if we look at A here, um, when they don't give us a base or a number, a subscript, we automatically assume that this is, means that they're base 10, okay? That the log here is a 10. So here, in, in, in example A, they all have the same base, so they're all base 10. So let's go ahead and uh, use our properties of logs to condense. So the first one is apply our power rule that says that when I have a number be multiplied to a log, I can convert that into an exponent. So this one didn't have an exponent or it's just one, so it stays the same, but I'm multiplying a six to this log, so this becomes y to the six. On this log, I'm multiplying a seven, so this becomes log of z to the seven. All right, now um, I like to work my graph my or my equations from left to right. So let's look at this first part here. It says that I have a log of x minus the log of y to the six. So now what I can do is I can apply my quotient rule that says that when I have two logs that are being subtracted, that means that I can divide it by um, applying the inputs, right? The log of x divided by the log of y to the 6. Oh, then it leaves me with these two logs that have the same base. Then since these two logs are being added to each other, I can use my, my product rule that says that when two logs have the same base and are being added, I multiply the inputs, right? So we have the log of base 10 of x of y to the 6 times z to the 7. We can simplify this by um, rewriting the product. And we have log of x times z to the 7 divided by y to the 6. So you see, we got a log that had, or we had an example that had three logs, and we condensed this to a single log. All right, let's go ahead and do B. Um, let's condense B. Um, so um, for this one, um, 
Uh -oh. Let's see, did I skip too, one too many? Um, let's let's get B and let's do. Um, since we, I wanna running out of time. Let's solve um for log equations, right? So let's do this one. A, A is um, natural log of x minus natural log of x plus six is equal to seven. So to solve this, again, I'm going to use my properties. Since these two logs have the same base and they're being subtracted, it's the same thing as dividing by um, x over x plus 6, which is my quotient rule. So this is the natural log of x divided by x plus 6 is equal to 7. Okay. So one way to solve this is to apply, uh, to change this log into an exponential form. So um, to change to an exponential form, the since this is a um, a natural log, we can use our natural exponent. So the natural um, exponent is the e. So the output of the log is the input of the exponent. The input of the log is the output of the exponent. So again, here the output is x over x plus six. So it's the output of my exponent. The output of the log was seven. So it's the input of my exponent, which is the power, right? e to the 7. So now I'm able to solve for, for x, right? So I'll multiply both sides by x plus 6, okay? Distribute the e to the 7, okay? Then I'm going to combine my like terms by putting everything that has an x on one side, okay? So when I do that, um, I'm able to factor out an x. And when I do this, I factor out an x, I get x times e to the 7 minus 1 is equal to minus e to the 7. Um, divide both sides by e to the 7 minus 1. It's going to give me x is equal to minus e to the 7 to the 6 divided by e to the 7 minus 1. I'll go ahead and plug these values into my calculator, and I have a little snapshot here um, using a TI-83 on, on all the parentheses that you have to use in order if you want to solve this with, with one step, okay? Um, and when we evaluate this, we get x is equal to negative 6.005, okay? Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and skip B, um, and let's go to try to get another um, topic for review. I want to get as much, many topics for you to get you ready for your finals um, next week. Um, so let's go ahead and I'll do this one. So solve the logarithm equation and let's solve it algebraically. We have log of base 9 of x minus log of base 9 uh, of 9 of x minus 8 is equal to 1 half. So again, I'm going to use my properties. So the first thing that I'm going to do is apply my quotient property to combine the two logs that are left of the equation. So I'm going to get log of base 9 is equal, or my input x over x minus 8 is equal to the 1 half. We can do the same thing that we did before. We can um, um, convert it to an exponent form. So we have 9 to the 1 half is equal to x over x minus 8 apply the same properties that I did right now to solve for x, and I get two values, x equals 12 and x equals 6. So you always want to also check your answers to make sure that that they do work, okay? So when we check our solution, when we check the value for 12, okay, um, we see that um, both sides give us a solution, and then for the 6, um, as well, I'm oh, sorry, it's not a solution, right? Because we could not translate, we cannot evaluate a negative two for a log. So our only solution for this problem, even though we got two values for x, we only have one, which is x equals 12, okay? All right, um, got to finish all of the slides. Um, uh, we have three more minutes. Does anybody have any final questions you would like to ask me? All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who want to review this, we do really have these uh, 
um, sessions recorded. I wish you all the best of luck in your finals. Please study hard. Um, uh, that's the only way you'll do really good on your finals. Okay, steady, steady, steady. Practice, practice, practice. And I know you all will do fine. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Um, please um, visit the tutors. They'll still be available um, if you have any questions. Again, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Carizales, for your wonderful presentation. I'll be stopping the recording now, but we do want to remind you guys about our previously recorded sessions, which are available on a YouTube playlist. This session will also be available on that playlist later tonight. Also linked is a short survey to help us improve our TVE sessions. Please take a few minutes to fill out that survey and another short survey to receive credit for attending. Thank you all for coming in today. We hope you have a lovely weekend. And thank you again, Mr. Carizales, for the presentation. Good luck on finals, everyone. We'll be back on January 21st with our TVE session. Thank you.